has a statement about God's character. It's a couple of them we'll look briefly at. We're actually going to be ending, not going to James, but uh, just by way of introduction. First John <clears throat> chapter one, <clears throat> verse five, says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that the God is light and in him is no darkness at all. <clears throat> Light is used to describe God's character. Uh, the, look, the Gospel of John, uh, first chapter, where we see the light is a manifestation of God's life. And so light is used metaphorically to describe God's kind of life. It's also used in First Timothy to describe something else concerning God. First Timothy chapter six. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry, Timothy. Okay. <laughs> Well, you're halfway there. <laughs> Subtract six, six. <laughs> First Timothy chapter six, verse sixteen says, "It's just looking back, verse fifteen. He will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, him be honor and eternal dominion." Amen. So this describes God dwelling place not only is he as to his very character light but he dwells in light and he dwells in a, a light that is so brilliant no human being in an unglorified state can approach to it and i say in an in unglorified state because there will come a day there is coming a day when we will be able to actually not only approach that light but we ourselves will be dwelling in that same same quality of light we'll be manifesting that quality of life, because we're going to be resurrected with the same glorified body, the same type of glorified body that Christ has, and we ourselves will manifest that type of light, and we will ourselves be dwelling in that quality of light. Can't understand it really, because we can't comprehend what that light really consists of. If no one can approach to it or or, or uh, dwell in it, it's pretty much impossible for us to really visualize or imagine what type of light would be so brilliant you can't even approach to it. It's, it's kind of mind-boggling to understand that. <clears throat> but nevertheless, this is a description of God's character and a description of his dwelling place. <clears throat> so when well, we're looking at the titles of the Father, uh, there's a title that references this quality, and it's found in the book of James, chapter 1. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 17. Just taking it in the middle of the context, we'll, we'll back up a little ways eventually here, but just looking at verse 17 alone for a moment, James chapter 1, verse 17. It says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning or shadow of, of that's due to change. <clears throat> so here we have a title, or I call it a title. It's a description of, of uh, God. And it says that, uh, and specifically he's referring to the Father. He's called the Father of the Lights. We have two different, different articles, the Father of the Lights, no direct statement concerning what these lights entail, but he's described as the father concerning the lights. Um, I think that probably this is more reference to the, the title father here is probably more in reference to the fact that he's the origin, looking at the one who originated these lights. But the question is, uh, what are these lights? First of all, I think we understand who God the Father is, the first person of the Trinity. <clears throat> but in what it relates to, not just Father of light in general, but we actually have the definite article, Father of the lights. Uh, lights is plural, and so there's a there's more than one, and it's a definite article, which indicates that there's uh, a specific group of lights that he's the Father of. And if you look at... Um, commentaries to figure out uh, what the answer is to the question, what are or who or what do these lights entail? Um, looking through commentaries that I have just to see what other people have written about this, I found eight different views as to what these lights consist con concern or consist of. Uh, so it gives you a, 
a lot of chances to roll the dice. <laughs> is it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? Uh, first one, I'm just going to mention them because uh, there are such a variety of opinions as to what this entails. Uh, first of all, it's viewed as a metaphor <clears throat> uh, that it ref and that this uh, father of lights refers to the qualities of goodness and wisdom. Since God's character is described as light, it seemed logical to some who hold this view <clears throat> that this term means that he's the originator of those qualities in his creation. The gifts God gives here are described as good or beneficial, and the other attribute mentioned in the context is truth. But people that hold this metaphorical view is that when he says he's the father of lights, that he's just the the or the origin of goodness and wisdom. Uh, you can look at the context. You can see that, that the term goodness is used in the context when it says every good gift. It's the same. It's the word for goodness here, uh, God's quality of goodness. Every good gift. Uh, the term wisdom is not found in the context, and so where a person would come up with this idea. Uh, you can see that there's a little bit of basis for possibility in, in the fact that the term goodness is used here, but wisdom is not. Uh, truth is used in the next verse, in verse 18, it says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of his truth, word of truth, that we should be a kind of first, first fruits of his creation. So truth as an attribute of God, <clears throat> as it's applied to his word, is used, uh, but the people that have held to this view uh, say that it's referring to goodness and truth. <clears throat> so there, there's a, a small degree of, of possibility that he could be referring to this if it's a metaphorical use of lights, um, because goodness is found in the context here. A second view is that it's a metaphor, and that it refers to the Urim and the Thummim in the Old Testament. What was the Urim and the Thummim? Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I, you're, you're using sign language, but I understand your sign language. Yeah. So, uh, the, the high priest's breastplate. Aaron, the, the high priest wore a, what was called Urim and Thummim uh, on his in his priestly garment, and it was apparently used to make discernment in some cases of, of uh, God's direction. Uh, we don't. I think the the terms are only used. I think about six times in the Old Testament. Uh, last reference to them, I believe, is in the book of Numbers. So we don't see how they were used. God doesn't really describe in the Old Testament, give, give us much information as how they were used. We speculate, uh, commentators have speculated that they were used almost like, like a dice roll. Um, yes. So Psalms 104, verse 2 talks about covering... It, it says, you, my Lord, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty who covers yourself with light as a garment. Okay. So the Old Testament talks about him using light, light as, as a garment. garment. Mm -hmm. Would that be like the sun? No, that would, would be, be like. That would mean that he, as to his very being, manifests light. Manifests yeah. light. Okay. If the sun didn't shine at all, God would still shine with a brilliance that is so bright that no human being in an unglorified state could approach unto it. <laughs> Okay. So we can't we can't conceive of that type of brightness. It's a brightness that we look at the sun with with unguarded eyes and we can go blind. If you were standing in the presence of God, uh, according to God's word, that, that our physical bodies couldn't handle it. Oh, the light is okay. so brilliant. So that there's an energy produced there um, that it's, it's unapproachable by human beings in an unglorified state. Did Moses come out blind and he did the he, yeah, he, he came. He, was, well, he didn't, didn't say that he came out blind. He came with his face veiled because the, his face shone with a brilliance that reflected that glory. Um, yeah, but he didn't look directly. He wasn't, at yeah, he, he was apparently wasn't there. directly in, in his presence. So, uh, in, in an unprotected state, anyway, or he wouldn't have been able to survive it. Uh, but as far as Urim and Thummim go, the, the term Urim and Thummim uh, refers to the Hebrew translation that I, I saw Urim refers to lights and Thummim refers to something that is perfect or complete, um, can refer to truth, <clears throat> that which is true. Um, and so in some capacity, Urim and Thummim, the, these objects that were kept in the high priest's garment had something to do with, <laughs> with um, truth and, um, and light. 
but beyond that, uh, we don't have a lot of specifics. And so for James to say that this is Urim and Thummim, um, refers to Urim and Thummim, I just have to shrug my shoulders and go, well, what's the, what's the, what's he trying to express with this idea? Um, since we don't really have a really clear idea of what Urim and Thummim were in the first place, why would James threw this out and without explaining what it is? This wouldn't tell us any, anything. He's saying that the father is a father of lights, uh, but if it's referring to Urim and Thummim, we don't know really what Urim and Thummim does. James wouldn't be giving us any information. He would be telling us something that wouldn't help us understand what he's trying to tell us <laughs> because he doesn't explain what Urim and Thummim so, so where they get this Urim and Thummim, other than the fact that Urim and Thummim means lights and completeness or truth, <clears throat> and he refers to completeness here, he says every good gift and every com perfect or complete gift, so he is referring to completion here, something that is complete, not lacking anything, is coming from above, comes from the Father of Lights. So we have lights mentioned here, and we have completion mentioned here, but how that relate to Urim and Thummim that refers to lights and, and perfection or truth, uh, I just have to shrug my shoulders and go, I, where do they get this from? Other than the fact that the two terms are used, it doesn't define what they are. So, but that's another view. Some have held that this refers to the fact that he's the God who, who orchestrated Urim and Thummim. Okay, fine. What is that? I don't know. Where do you get that from? Um, I don't know. Uh, next view is also, you can, if you wanted to take a guess that it's metaphorical, you would be right. Because the vast majority of these views are that it's a metaphorical use of terms, uh, that it refers to the angels. If you look at Psalm 104, this is the term that is used of, of the angels. The book of Psalms 104. Psalm 104, verse 4. This is, uh, verse 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, as you just mentioned, covered in light. And going further in Psalm 104, it says that he established, excuse me, verse 4, he makes the winds his messengers, flaming fires his ministers. He establishes the earth upon his foundations and so on. So here he referred to his ministers, which is, um, most likely a reference to spirit beings of a flaming fire, which indicate that there's there's a light associated with spirit beings. Uh, we're told in the New Testament that Satan uh, masquerades as a messenger, a minister of light. Uh, and so uh, light is associated with spirit beings. Uh, the fact that it says that this in James 1, 17, that... Uh, these, these gifts come down from the father of the lights and, and spirit beings inhabit the starry spaces. Uh, so uh, that therefore these father of lights refers to the fact that he's the father, the originator of spirit beings. Well, it's a true statement. He is the, the originator of spirit beings. And it is true that they are ministers of light. However, uh, again, I would have to ask, what would that, what relationship would that have to the message that James is speaking here in, in James chapter one? <clears throat> uh, just leave that with an open-ended question at the moment. Uh, another view, uh, this one, they call it a spiritual view. Now, what's the difference between a spiritual view and a metaphorical view? No difference at all. <laughs> One view sounds more Christian-like than the other. <laughs> okay, that, that's my, if, if, if you, anybody wants to correct me on that, feel free to. But if I call it a spiritual view, well, that makes me sound more, more biblical and maybe more, more um, correct biblically than, than if I just say metaphorical sounds like, like, a, like a Gnostic or a philosopher or a spiritual sounds more Christian. It's a metaphor, okay? It's just a fancy term, fancier term for metaphor, but it's um, spiritually refers to grace and glory. Well, okay, grace and glory. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of the lights, uh, referring to grace and glory. Grace is, is a is a gift, and glory is a gift from God. Well, it's true. A grace is a 
is a, a quality of the gifts that God gives, and we are and glory. We are going to be glorified. That's a that's a grace gift, part of our salvation. That is something we receive. Um, but again, in the context of James, what's he talking about there? There is salvation um, mentioned or, or inferred in James chapter one. In the next verse, when it says, in, going back to James chapter one, uh, verse 18, when it says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. So this is uh, referencing aspects of our salvation, um, not grace and glory specifically but grace and glory are definitely um involved in this <clears throat> but again uh that's a, a another metaphorical view that is used i'm not trying to explain some of these metaphorical views because i don't know the thoughts of the person who presented them i don't know what motivated them to come up with these different metaphors i'm just presenting what some different views are and uh, if, if you like the sound of them you're welcome to do with them as you like i don't necessarily hold to them myself i'll, I'll get to the one that i do hold that it is referring to uh, in just a moment uh next one for second corinthians chapter four is a view that some hold second corinthians chapter four Verse 4 says that in their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of the Christ, who is the image of, of God. So the father of the lights, in the view of some people, is that the glory to the father of lights is referring to he's the father of, of that gospel of salvation that's referred to as as the light it brings god's quality of life to us if we believe the gospel of salvation so it's referring to the father of the lights is referring to the father of the gospel of the light of the gospel of, of our salvation uh, another metaphorical view goes on to in second corinthians 4 verse 6 says for god who said let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of god in the face of jesus christ so here they, they take it a little bit further than just the gospel of salvation that this father of lights refers to that illumination that god gives concerning who god is specifically jesus christ uh, to those that are in his family believers so that we can understand who god is and so the father of lights is his illuminating us to the very character of god so we can understand who god is and that's what the father of lights is referring to there is um, a political answer so there's there's um this one's not a metaphor this is the politician who well, there is an episode on gilligan's island years and years ago where there is this uh, problem came up and everybody had a different opinion as to how to meet this problem and gilligan's response to marianne was well you, I, you you're right marianne and then ginger comes along with a different opinion you're right ginger and the professor had a different answer you're right professor and so and the skipper hits him on the head with his cap and says they can't all be right gilligan he says you know skipper you're right <laughs> so everybody's right that's the politician's answer and, there, and there's a political answer in this there's, there's one commentator says that this father of lights refers to all of the above that all of these metaphorical views are right that he's just the father of, of all lights and <clears throat> that i have a specific answer to the fact that you have the definite article used in james 1 17 that he's the father of the lights so there's out of all the lights that are out there there is one specific group of light of lights that he's referred to as being the father of <clears throat> so i don't hold to the political view because i don't hold to the metaphorical views here either the uh, last view, uh, this is the one that I believe is referring to, and we'll, we'll get to that. I believe he's very literally looking at the lights that are, the physical lights that are seen in, in the heavenly places. And the reason I hold that is because the way the verse is written, uh, he says, well, I'm going to go back to the quote it just right, in James, going back to James chapter 1 in verse 17. <laughs> He says, every good gift, every complete gift is from above coming down from. Now, if we just stop right there, what's 
what's the natural tendency when you say the source of this is coming down from the natural tendency coming from where you look up what do you see when you look up you see lights in heavenly places and it doesn't matter whether you're looking up during the daytime or if you're looking up at the nighttime you're going to see lights and i say lights plural because even in the daytime you can see a plurality of lights a lot of the time you don't always see the moon but a lot of times during the daytime you can see the moon if it's in a phase where it's coming around there it's just not as bright as it is at nighttime because during the daytime <clears throat> it's overpowered by the light from the sun but um, book of genesis tells us that god gave uh, a lights for a specific reason if you go back to genesis chapter one genesis chapter one Verse 14. It says, and God said, let there be lights. And I have a plural, plural here. Said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And... <clears throat> Let them be for, oh, verse 15, let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also, and God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from darkness. And what did God see when he looked at this? He saw that it was good. So God placed lights up above. And those lights were for the benefit of mankind. Those were to delegate those human beings, well, not just human beings, but all of creation. Uh, the plant life is delegated, is relegated by light cycles of, of light and dark, the animal uh, kingdom is uh, regulated by uh, cycles. That's what I'm trying to come up with, <laughs> cycles of light and dark. And for God's biological, excuse me, creation that functions on seasons and days and night cycles, uh, his providing that is a demonstration of God's goodness. It, the, the word goodness that's used in James is agathos, which is a word that demonstrates, that describes one of God's attributes, is the attribute of goodness. And that's a goodness that seeks for the benefit of, of others. It provides a, a sense of inner satisfaction that produces happiness. Now, happiness isn't goodness, but happiness is the result of goodness. God's a happy God, and he promotes happiness, and, and he desires happiness for his creation. And this, all, all of the things that are involved in Genesis chapter one and the renovation of the earth is good because it supplies things that are beneficial and promotes the happiness and well-being of his, of his biological creation. The angels apparently didn't need seasons of day-night cycles and, and uh, seasons of uh, winter, spring, summer, but that wasn't that wasn't for them. That was for us, and, and it's good for us. It provides for most for our well-being. And so it says in Genesis that he he was the one who who designed and set in motion these heavenly lights for a specific benefit for his biological creation. <clears throat> Now, if you go back to James <clears throat> chapter one, we'd have to ask ourselves, as I did the other metaphorical uh, views of, of light, uh, how does this understanding, how does this view uh, relate to the message that James is speaking? Well, to understand that we have to look a little bit further back in the context to see what he's he's saying in James chapter one. If you go back, I'm not going to read the whole, whole chapter here for time's sake, but we'll look at a few of the key verses here. If you go back to James chapter one, starting in verse two, he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet uh, various trials or temptations, for you know that the testing of your faith produces uh, steadfastness and let uh, uh, or endurance, patience, let patience have its uh, maturing effect that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Um, 
Verse 5 says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who has generously given to all without uh, holding back, and it will be given to him. Uh, going down to verse uh, 12, <clears throat> blessed or happy is the man who remains steadfast or, or uh, patient under trials or testing. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which he, referring to God, has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he was tempted by God, and by the way, all these references to God have the definite article, so it's referring to God the Father through this, this whole concept here, this whole context. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one, but each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully matured, brought to fruition, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every complete gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning or shadow that's due to change. So he's he's referencing here uh, two different things. He's describing elements that mankind brings to the table, and he's describing those things which God brings to the table. And when he says, it says in verse 16, don't be deceived, uh, that's inferring, at least to me, that there was error circulating concerning what God brings to the table. And that error revolved around the understanding or misunderstanding as to what the or where the origin of sin is. He says, don't be deceived, brothers. God, uh, he, and he just described the source of sin. Sin starts with a temptation, and when we make the determination to yield unto that temptation, it yields for sin. Did God make us do it? No. What's the concept here? We have a sin nature innate within ourselves that we make the determination that we will turn aside from God doing which is a reflection of God's character and and do which is contrary to God's desire as well. We we choose to sin. Uh, I know we've we've all heard this this um, statement that was made popular not too many decades ago that the devil made me do it. Uh, an error that uh, was promoted as uh, comedy, but it's an idea that has been promoted by many individuals that uh, Satan is the author of all of our all the things that befall us. And if we just got rid of Satan, we wouldn't have any problems. And that's that's deception because Satan is not the origin of our sin nature. Satan is not the origin of the evil that dwells within me. My sin nature dwells within me. And when Satan <clears throat> no longer exists, uh, as long as my sin nature is not taken care of, sin will, will still exist because sin dwells within me because I have a sin nature. And so James is saying, don't be deceived. God's not the source of your problems. <clears throat> He's not the one who's making you do the things that that's... Uh, Contrary to what God wants, desires, what contrary to what is true, contrary to what is uh, brings glory to Him, uh, that comes from within your own self. That comes down. And it's just, so every good gift and every gift that is complete comes down from the Father of the lights, with whom there is no shadow, no variation, no shadow that's due to change. If you look up the starry host. Uh, within the stars themselves, within the sun, there's nothing within those those uh, heavenly bodies that promote shadows within in themselves. I mean, there are times that they're obscured from view, but they're not obscured from view because they cease to shine or because they go somewhere to hide their light. They cease to shine because something comes between us and, the, and them so that we can't see them. They don't change. They're still up there doing what they do. <laughs> And they can and, and they do it by themselves. So that, that carries the idea of completeness. Uh, when God set the, the stars and heavenly bodies in motion, he doesn't have to have angels go out there every single night uh, with, with their big lighters and, and start the, the fires going on all the sun because he didn't have a uh, uh, his his creation there wasn't complete. Uh, in other words, he's saying the complete the creation is completed. It, it functions on its own, it doesn't need uh, any outside help to keep going. You know, we, we have the passage in, I think it's Colossians, that says that Christ upholds everything by the word of his power, keeps it all together. But but this creation, he set in motion, 
it, it functions pretty much on its own. <laughs> uh, if there's darkness comes between us and, and that starry host, it's not because they cease to shine. It's because something had come in between them. And James is saying <clears throat> that uh, when, when evil comes into our life, when we're faced with, with um, choice to, to uh, temptation to, to sin, to do that which is uh, contrary to God's character, it's not because God is... is trying to get us to do evil he's not changing is something something has come between us and god and that's something that has come with between us and god is from within ourselves god's not the origin of it now god may allow this stuff but we're the source of our own problem we have we have a sin nature and that's what comes between us and god uh when when uh sin exists uh it, it's not God's not the origin of it. And so we have here that um, these, these um, this statement, the father of lights, he's directing his readers to look at an illustration within creation that they have to describe a reality that exists in God's character. When, when God is described as light himself and that he dwells in inescapable light, uh, there's this thought within some philosophies that there can't exist good apart from evil. With, I think Chinese call it yin and yang. Uh, with every good, there has anything that's good has to have an opposite quality of evil for it to exist. And so uh, anything that is called God, uh, if, if God is good, he also has to have an evil side because they have to be good can't exist without evil balancing it out, balancing the equation out. I don't know if that's the exactly the idea that was being promoted here. I don't know the specific errors that that uh, might have been promoted uh, within James uh, congregation that he's writing to, <clears throat> but in some capacity they were writing or they, they were being tempted with with these false notions that uh, the goodness of God can't exist apart from evil. So there has to be an evil side to God. And these problems that are coming your way <clears throat> uh, have to be coming from God. And, and James is saying, look up and, and see the illustration that God has given of the starry host. Uh, and yes, spirit beings do dwell in the starry host and they are messengers of light. But James readers can't see those angels. Those wouldn't be, spirit beings wouldn't, I don't think, be a vile illustration to what James is trying to present here. Uh, he is describing qualities of God, which could be referring to goodness. Uh, but he's referring specifically to those elements out there that you can physically see with your eyes. The gifts that God gives are good, which they promote for well-being. They promote for <clears throat> that which is um, provides for an element of happiness within his creation. He's not the source of, of sin that brings sorrow and calamity. He's the source of that which produces good and happiness. He's not the one that promotes uh, darkness, but he's the one who dwells in light and he promotes a character that manifests light, not darkness. God doesn't doesn't have a, a yin and yang. He doesn't have a yang side to him. <laughs> he, he doesn't have a side that uh, manifests one face to you and then turn his back to you and, and manifest a different side at some other time where he demonstrates goodness at one time of the day and evil at another time. God is consistent. No matter which direction he's facing, no matter what course of action he is choosing to take, he is always demonstrating that which is light. He's always demonstrating a quality that um, is in harmony with the gifts that he gives. The gifts that he gives are always in harmony with his character. And so if he dwells in light, if he is good as to his character, if he is true as to his character, then the gifts he gives are in harmony with his character. So when he's saying he's going, he's uh, every good gift, every complete gift comes down from the father of the lights, that same God who created those, that starry host up there, who has provided the needs of all humanity to to function properly in days and years and you know the seasons, the, the cycles of, of day and night. He's provided for all of creation's needs. Uh, that's the same God who gives gifts to you. Those gifts are still, that he provides are, are good gifts. 
and they are complete. They're not lacking anything. So when he goes on to verse 18 here and he says, of his own will, he wasn't constrained to do this. It was a, this will, word will is determination. This is what he determined to do. Um, of his own will, determination, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of, of his creation. That is a gift. One of the gifts that he's given to us, uh, he's given to James readers, and that involves a salvation that is a complete gift. It's not lacking anything. We haven't received the end of our salvation yet, but that salvation is nonetheless complete. It's going to bear fruit in, in the end. And so there's nothing lacking in the salvation. Just because we not haven't reached the end of the road yet, we haven't received the end of our salvation yet, that gift of salvation that God has given us is a complete gift, and it will be brought to, to uh, fruition. Okay. When he says here, uh, at the at the end of the verse here, when he says that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation, he's actually stating here that we are, in essence, maybe I'm stretching a little bit here, but he says we are God's gift to himself. We are his creation, and God is giving himself a gift that is complete. There's nothing lacking, and just because I'm lacking at the moment, uh, when we look at the entire package, the entire package uh, is complete. And so uh, the, the product of, of, of God's goodness, the grace gift that he's provided to his creation is ultimately not lacking in anything. And <clears throat> what he's saying here is that um, this is a reflection upon God's character. God's character is, is one that completely desires the well-being and happiness of his creation and the gifts that he gives are in keeping with that. And if there's something that is outside of that, if there's something contrary to that, then God is not the author of it. And that's the message that he's, he's speaking here. Um, oh, I thought there was a question. Here, Father, Father is not the, 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 um, author of sin. I haven't heard this directly stated so much, and yet in reality, Christians really seem to um, embrace this false idea about God a lot of the time, because while, while we may not say, be so blatant as to say God is the source of my sin nature, uh, that that would seem kind of, kind of brazen to say something like that, and it would be definitely error. But in, in, in practice, a lot of times Christians actually do attribute this to God because when we're facing calamity, uh, when, when we fail, uh, we blame God for it. Christians are constantly blaming God for the evil that comes into our life uh, that most of the time is a result of our own, of our own doing. Uh, when we fall flat on our face because of our own sin, we shake our fist at God. God, why did you do this to me? Why did you allow this to happen to me? And we blame God for the evil that that we that our own sin nature produces. And while it seems like a very basic concept, uh, it apparently is a big enough problem within Christians' minds that we view God incorrectly in this way. That uh, God directed the Holy Spirit directed James to write rather extensively concerning this: that God is not the source of our problems. Our sin nature is the source of most of our problems. We have the world system and we have Satan as well. But the biggest source of our problems that separates us from God, that brings something in between us and the light so that, we, that that light is obscured, so we can't see that light that God has to offer. That's something that comes between us and the sun, metaphorically speaking, is our own sin nature. And he describes it, the process of it, very clearly here when he says in verse 13, let no one say when he is uh, tempted, I am tempted by God, for cannot God cannot be tempted uh, with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, that craving that comes from within. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully, excuse me, matured, uh, brings forth death. The term that he uses for here for, for temptation is one that is uh, usually used as a solicitation to evil. Um, it can be uh, used with reference to testing to see if, if there is something good or evil. 
but it's a word that is normally used most frequently in scripture as a solicitation to do evil. And that's in, in uh, contrast to a word, the word for testing in verse two. It's used one time here in verse two. It says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you uh, meet trials of various kinds. That's our word for a solicitation to evil. Uh, for you know that the testing, that this word is a different word. It's a different word. It's, it's, uh, this is uh, the word that is, is <clears throat> to uh, test for approval. This is the word testing that specifically used to test with the idea of looking to approve at, at what, you, what you're looking at. In other words, when you're looking at, at a uh, gold coin, uh, you're not looking, hoping that it's a counterfeit. You're looking at it to see if it, it is just gold plated, is it genuine gold? You're looking with a desire, hoping that you're going to find this is completely gold. And so that word is used in verse two here only one time. Uh, the rest of the time, the word for testing here is, is a word that is usually used to describe a solicitation to evil. And that's what he's, he's using primarily in the, in the last half of the chapter here when he's saying in verse 13, let no one say when he's tempted, he's tempted by God. It's that word. It's not the word to looking for approval. It's the, the word for testing that is looking for uh, trying to find something that is not, uh, not genuine. And in other words, something to be disapproved of. He says, so it's a, it's a, let no one say when he's tempted, let no one say when he's solicited uh, to do evil, that I'm being solicited to do evil by God. <laughs> I'm saying this, this solicitation to do evil is actually coming from a craving within your own self, a desire from within your own self to do that, solicit, to, uh, to do that evil. <laughs> God is not the source of that. <laughs> so. And, and he makes a distinction here. The sin is not the temptation. The temptation is not the sin. The solicitation to evil is not the sin. The sin is when uh, that solicitation to evil is, is fed upon and considered and it actually bears forth. It actually produces something. It results in an activity. It results in an activity. And the activity is the sin. The solicitation to evil is not sin. The temptation is not the sin, but the fruit. What it results when it produces something when it produces an action that action is sin and god is not associated with anything that solicits us to participate in an activity that results in sin god is not the source of that that comes from within <laughs> i'm actually done a few minutes early so there you go <laughs> father we do thank you that this revelation concerning yourself as that uh, when you describe yourself as one who is not just father by title, but father who is a good father because you care for your own, this, uh, this description of you further verifies that, uh, that you're the father of lights. You're the father within whom, within your own being, there is no shadow within yourself. There's nothing that casts a shadow. There's nothing that di uh, dims uh, your light in any capacity. Uh, you are as your very being a God who is good and desires the well-being of your creation within your family, and you promote that. And while that uh, goodness has to be clarified by that which you describe as good, uh, it's not what our sin nature describes as good. And we oftentimes want, we blame you for for not wanting our happiness because we want uh, we, we want our sin nature to be. Uh, gratified, and that's what we view as happiness. Uh, your word tells us that actually results in calamity. And because you're a good God, you have given us the capacity to have victory over that sin nature because it always results in calamity, even though it deceives us into thinking uh, it would promote goodness, it does not. And we just thank you that you are a good God who does promote happiness, you promote well being, and you provide us with the tools necessary to experience that true happiness, that true goodness within our lives that uh, demonstrates uh, a life that's in harmony with your life that brings glory to you should we choose to avail ourselves of it. We thank you for these grace gifts.